We are today in 1 Peter chapter 1. We are going to be looking at verses 10 through 16 in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. And it says, As to the salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what, a per what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you, in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy, Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So that's our, this is our section for today. And I don't know about you, but it seems to me as if the whole world, specifically the Western society, has taken the fast lane into everything that is evil and contrary to God. And in this era of endless information, it seems like less and less people seem to be aware of their spiritual condition and the gravity of their sin. And the reason is that more and more people are redefining their own truth, and they're appro appropriating this truth by creating their own reality based on their self-centered and sinful desires. But... The good news is that reality and truth are solely determined by God and not by man's intellect or ingenuity. In reality, every human being that is born after Adam's fall is a sinner in need of a savior. And that savior is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to die on the cross for lost sinners like you and me. So in our passage today, we are going to talk about this salvation and some of its implications. So just as a brief recap, uh, Peter wrote this letter to believers in Asia Minor, and these believers were going through severe persecution from the Roman Empire. And in spite of these difficult circumstances and this severe persecution that they're facing, these Christians were not crushed by their difficult circumstances because they were actually looking forward with an absolute confidence to the resurrection that was promised to them. So no matter what happened to them in this life, they had the certainty that the future was nothing compared, the, the blessings that we we're going to refu, uh, receive in the future were nothing compared to the sufferings. I'm take, I'm take it back. The <laughs> sufferings right now were nothing compared to the future that was coming to them. So in the previous uh, uh, sections of this letter, Peter has spoken about the salvation we have in Christ and the future hope of eternal life in heaven. And Peter also spoke about the trials and the temptations that sooner or later were, were, will come into our lives. And, and he also speaks about how believers experience this magnificent and overwhelming joy even in the midst of the most difficult and painful trials. So now, in verses 10 through 12, Peter is going to demonstrate how great is this salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Peter says in verse 10, As to this salvation... The prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries. So Peter begins this verse referring to the salvation he was spoke in the previous verse, which is the salvation of our souls. And here salvation, the salvation that Peter speaks about, refers to the salvation that believers have in the present that will ultimately be consummated in the future. So this salvation that was prophesied in the past by the Old Testament prophets is what is said in focus here. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the prophets predicted the coming and the passion of the Messiah. The Old Testament prophets described salvation as a grace that at some point would come, at some point in the future. Now here there's a phrase that says prophesied of the grace that would come. 
This phrase does not suggest that the prophets were looking forward to a saving grace that was not already in existence in the Old Testament time. The scriptures teach that God never changes, and therefore, God has always been a merciful and gracious God. So, this makes evident, this is evident through the scriptures. Let me give you uh, three examples of this uh, uh, constant grace and mercy that, that, that God has shown. In Exodus, and let's start in, in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, we see Noah receiving grace from God. Then later on in Exodus, chapter 22, verses 26 to 27, we read how Moses was fully aware of God's grace. And then in Jonah, chapter 4, verse 2, Jonah acknowledges that God is a gracious God. These are just three examples to show you that from the very beginning, salvation has been available for sinners always through faith by grace. The Old Testament prophets knew that somehow undeserving sinners would receive mercy and forgiveness from God. They didn't quite know exactly how, but they knew that this was the case. They had some pieces of the puzzle, but they did not have the whole picture. So let me offer this illustration to try to make it clear of what was their mindset. So let's pretend that the Old Testament, the Old Testament time was this long and dark tunnel on the road to eternity. And there are some people in there that are walking toward the other end where they can see a very bright light. And in front of this light, they saw the shape of a man standing in front of the light. And this man is there standing with open arms waiting for them. So the man is far enough that they cannot see his face or his features, but they know he's there. And they're close enough that they can hear echoes of his voice. And while they did not know his name or how he looked, or any personal details, they did know and believed that he was the Messiah that God had promised to send to rescue them from the bondage of sin. They knew that much. So salvation has always been by grace, through faith in the Messiah, in the Savior, who we now know to be the Lord Jesus Christ. So Old Testament believers were saved by a future grace, a, fu a grace that they saw in the future. And we, New Testament believers, we are saved by a past grace, something that we see that happened in the past. And the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ, is at the apex of that salvation. Now, again, back to the prophets. They knew that God had gave, given them partial revelation about salvation. They knew that they had an incomplete insight into God's purposes. And the question then is, why did God not give them all the pieces of information that, that they needed? Why didn't he give them the whole picture? Well, it's because the time had not come yet. It was not time for all these things to be fulfilled. So the prophecies of mercy, the prophecies of mercy, of grace and power, were not intended for the Old Testament prophets. They were intended for Peter's readers here in the New Testament, far in the future. And it is for very reason this very reason that the Old Testament prophets did not experience the blessings of salvation in the same ways that New Testament believers do. The prophets were well aware that their knowledge about the Messiah and the promises of salvation were incomplete. They knew there was something miss missing, so that's why they devoted themselves to investigate, to study their own writings with the greatest intent and care in order to discern, in order to comprehend more clearly the meaning of their own writings, of their own prophecies. So these men did so because they longed to participate in this salvation. They wanted to, to experience it. They wanted to be a part of it. And while they did receive the gift of salvation, they were not able to see its full accomplishment because it was not time yet. The prophets wrote about the Messiah without actually having seen him in person or knowing him by name. So they did not have a personal relationship with Christ, as you and I do. They did not have a clear understanding of the full meaning of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. But they had an idea, and they knew that he was coming. They just didn't have all the details yet. 
Peter then continues in verse 11 saying, seeking to know what, a, what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. In this first section of verse 11, Peter tells us that the prophets were seeking to know what person or time. In other words, the prophets made every effort to learn what person would come to save God's people and when will this person exactly come? Exactly what era? What year? Where, where is he showing up? Then in the second section of verse 11, Peter tells us that the prophecies made by the Old Testament prophets were not educated guesses. These were not personal theories. These were not just their inventions. Instead, these prophecies were actually revelations made by the Spirit of Christ. And in this case, the Spirit of Christ does not refer to Jesus' human spirit. Instead, it refers to the Holy Spirit who was sent by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the implication here is this, that since the Holy Spirit was the source of the revelation that the prophets received and the inspiration that they had, their prophecies, prophecies were all authoritative and accurate. And that is very important to remember. And I'm going to tell you why. There is an issue that seems to be regaining some prominence within Christianity today in 2023 and maybe for some time now. And this is the issue of modern prophets. Uh, we need to be very aware of this deception that is gaining popularity. Some people might have uh, had experience with this, probably. Some, some might not, but I'm, I'm here to tell you. Uh, it seems to become, be more and more in prominence. So recently, I had a very short conversation with a man who is convinced that we still have prophets going around giving revelation and communicating message from God to the people. And, you know, as we had this little conversation, this guy disclosed that in his estimation, uh, the gift of prophecy and many other gifts of the Spirit are an essential tool that God used even today to bring people to salvation because if people didn't see miracles, they wouldn't believe. That's his argument. And I, I just listened politely and I didn't engage because we, this was not the time to do so. But, but I do have to say that I don't believe this is true. I believe the Lord spoke to us through his written word and through his son. And there is no more revelation needed. The canon is closed and God has spoken. What we have in the scriptures is what he wanted to reveal and this is it. So the question then is, how do we make sense of these claims? What, what, what am I supposed to think? I mean, like what he says sounds about right. I mean, that we had prophets and, 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 and so how do we do this? Well, the scriptures recognize only two types of prophets. There's either genuine prophets and false prophets. A genuine prophet is a speaker for God. He's a mouthpiece or a spokesman for God. That is, a, that is a, a, an actual prophet. And then a false prophet is that one who speaks of his own heart and not from the mouth of God. So the way to distinguish a, a false prophet is described in two passages in Deuteronomy. And specifically, I want to read Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 20 through 22, which says this. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, a word which I have not commanded him to speak or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Verse 21. And if you say in your heart, how will we recognize the word which the Lord has not spoken? That's a question. Verse 22. When the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and the thing does not happen or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. You are not to be afraid of him. That's what the scripture says. In other words, since genuine prophets speak of in God's behalf, everything that they say, all their prophecies, all their messages, have to be 100% accurate 100% of the time. Because if they are not, these are false prophets who have spoken out of their own heart. So the issue that we have here is that we need to be very careful in discerning what is right from what is almost right. There's a big difference in those two. That almost makes an infinite difference. So I was explaining yesterday to my son, there was this guy preaching in the streets and he was 
he was talking about Jesus and he was talking about the Bible and that's all we, we heard. And he was asking me, is that right or is that wrong? I said, well, we need to hear everything he has to say. Because not because you invoke the name of Jesus, not because you say God or the Bible, that actually means that you're a Christian. There's, there's a lot more going on there, so we need to hear everything he has to say. And in this case with the prophets, it's the same thing. We need to discern. What does the scripture say? Is this right or is this almost right? Because that makes a difference. Now, back in our text, Peter concluded verse 11 by telling us that by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the prophets predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. In other words, the prophets spoke of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, ascension, and enthronement. Through the scriptures, Isaiah and many others spoke about this. The pattern seen in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ would inevitably serve as an encouragement to these believers that are going through severe persecution. And the suffering of Jesus Christ, as we see here, was followed by glory. Therefore, those who are in Christ, those who are suffering today, will also experience glory after their suffering, just like the Lord did. Now, our suffering does not signify that God has abandoned us or that he has betrayed us. On the contrary, our suffering is not only a sign of fellowship and identification with Christ, it is also in a way a sign of the glory that, we'll, that we will receive when we enter into the presence of the triune God in heaven. So Peter's readers back then and us today would be and must be encouraged by this reminded, reminding that the pattern that we see in the life of Christ is in fact the pattern of our lives. There might be much suffering today, but there won't be any in future. There'll be glory and peace and comfort. Then in verse 12, Peter makes it clear that God revealed to the prophets that they would not personally witness the fulfillment of their own prophecies. Sorry guys, you're not going to see it. This is not for you to see yet. Verse 12 says, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things in which, into which angels long to look. So the prophets, as I was saying, they were, they were not serving themselves. They were serving other Christians, these Christians in Asia Minor, to which Peter was addressing in this letter. This is hundreds of years later. So, in other words, the Old Testament prophets were serving believers on the other side of the cross. And Peter says that those prophecies were now being announced to the New Testament believers through those who preached the gospel to them. So, these people that are preaching the gospel to them, of course, are the 12 apostles, who just like the Old Testament prophets were also sent by God with a message that was inspired and with the guidance of the Holy Spirit who was sent from heaven. And these prophets and these apostles were giving us the gospel all the way until now. They were both under the influence, guidance of the Holy Spirit. And now I would like to speak briefly another issue that is of importance today that has to do with the Old Testament. Because as absurd as it may sound, there are some professing believers who believe that the Old Testament is no longer relevant. There are, there are preachers there coming out from prestigious seminaries that everybody thought that these guys were solid because of the education that they received or their, their uh, 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 family tree that dismissed the, the Old Testament altogether. And this view of dismissing or, or, or reducing the importance of the Old Testament is not only sad, it is also wrong and dangerous. The Old Testament points to the New Testament and the New Testament points to the Old. So you can understand one without the other. The New Testament fulfills what is found in the Old Testament. There is no way around. They are both equally important. We need to read them, we need to study them, we need to have them and understand them, they're both the Word of God. In fact, the point is made by the Lord Jesus Christ himself in Luke 24, verse 44, where the Lord said this, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, 
that all the things that are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Later, he's going to tell another group, if you believe Moses, you would believe me because he wrote about me. So the Old Testament speaks about Christ. We cannot understand the new without the old. Therefore, the prophecies of the Old Testament are equally important as the proclamation of the gospel in the New Testament. We need to remember that. Now, back in our text, possibly in an effort to stimulate his audience's interest and gratitude, Peter says that the angels long to look or to reflect upon these truths of salvation that the prophets foretold. Now, we don't have a lot more going on here for this phrase. We don't know why Peter said it. I'm, we, there are people that speculate that this might be just to make things more uh, attractive or interesting for them. Um, so he throws this phrase there. So what I need to say about this is that angels are part of God's creation. And, and the knowledge and the authority that they have is, is limited. God will tell them exactly how to do, what to do, and how to do it, and when. Because they're messengers. That's what the world angel means. And while angels, of course, are, as I said, messengers of God who oppose demons and perform many divine duties, they are not made in the image of God. And they are not recipients of salvation. Therefore, they are not part of, of God's family. They are just helpers. So since angels do not experience the gospel in the same way that human beings do, they can only reflect and marvel at the grace and glory of salvation. They, they see it. They are watching how these things are unfolding and happening, and they're just wondering, how would this work? How, how, how would it be to experience this grace? Holy angels do not need to be saved. Fallen angels cannot be saved, and therefore they can only wonder. They can only imagine what is it to experience this infinite grace and mercy that the God of the universe bestows on these undeserving humans by rescuing them from their eternal damnation, from their sin, and he makes them their own children. It's amazing. I mean, even us would marvel at that, but we experience it. They don't. So that's why they can just... See, they want to understand. They want to, to find out what's, what it would be like. Now, so far in verses 1 through 12, Peter has described and explained the nature of salvation. And in the following verses, Peter now is going to command believers to live a holy life based on what God has done from them in Christ. So verse 13 says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in, in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here, the conjunction, therefore, connects everything that was said in verses 1 through 12 with verse 13. And now it's a, it makes a transition where the readers go from, from, a, from statement to application. So it moves us from knowing in the previous verses what God has done for us to now to see how is it that we should live our lives. So Peter says that we begin applying these concepts that he taught about. We begin by preparing our minds, by putting our thoughts together, by holding our thoughts captive. This is the issue of mental discipline. And this mental discipline does not just happen automatically. It requires intentional effort and concentration. Like any other training, we need to make an effort to train our minds, to discipline our minds. The scripture tells us that believers discipline their minds by feeling it and dwelling on the things that are true, on the things that are honorable, right, pure, lovely, of good repute, and worthy of praise. In other words, we prepare our minds by filling it with scripture. And I know I say this a lot, but, but this is the truth. That's how we are prepared for everything, through the filling of our minds with the scripture. And this mental preparation also requires us to keep a sober spirit. This phrase refers to spiritual alertness, and it's a clarity of mind. It is to be in control of our thoughts and our actions. So the idea that Peter is conveying here is that believers must be ready for whatever may come. This is the complete opposite of, of, of drunkenness. 
A drunk person is, is not, it, it, it's impaired. Their, uh, their, their reaction is not as fast as it should. They're groggy, they cannot see right, they cannot stand right, they're not ready for anything. They're impaired. This is the absolute opposite. We need to be alert and ready for whatever may come. And here we must recognize that mental alertness and discipline are not the result of sheer willpower. It is not the result of our own ability or merit or effort. Instead, it is the result of the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts when we fill it with the Word of God. The, word, the Spirit is at work in us. We feed our soul and our heart with the Word of God, and that's what the Spirit uses to move, to encourage, to, 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 push, us, to push us forward. Finally, Peter concludes this verse with an imperative saying, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here the word hope is almost equivalent to faith. The word hope, well, let me start with faith. Faith involves trusting in the present, what God has already said and done in his word. And hope is to trust in what God promised to do in the future at the second coming of Christ. So our hope is rooted on the expectation of a future reward, which is glorification. It's the time when God fully and permanently brings the believer into his eternal inheritance, which is eternal life in the kingdom of heaven, in the presence of God Almighty. That's our hope. That's what we're looking forward to. And as we saw in previous lessons, it is this hope that gives us strength and gives us ability to endure the different trials and hardships of life. Peter says here that our hope must be complete. It must be unreserved. In other words, he's saying that there should be no doubt or no indecision in regard to God's promises for the future. We need to be certain of this and act accordingly. This is a promise that God made and he will fulfill it. There should not be any hesitation when we think about the future. That's what Peter is saying. Do not have any second thoughts about this. It's happening. We must not lose, lose sight that we have been justified in the past. We, have been, we are being sanctified in the present and we will be glorified in the future. There's three aspects to our salvation. Past when we believe, present when we're sanctified, being made more like the Lord Jesus Christ in the future will be glorified. So we must stay the course, however difficult it might be. We must keep looking forward to our, fi to the, our final salvation, which will be fully experienced at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 14. In this verse, Peter says that there needs to be a difference in the way we live. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former laws which were yours in your ignorance. So one of the many differences between believers and unbelievers is obedience to God. Those who have been born again have been set apart, and now we have been blessed with the desire and the ability to obey God and to do the things that please him. If you think about your unbelieving years, I can think about those things. I, I, it, it hasn't been that long. It has actually been long, but it, it doesn't seem that long. Um, I didn't have any desire. I mean, I knew that there was a God. I knew that there was you know, scripture, but I never actually felt the need or desire to read it, much less obey what it said. I mean, like I thought, I don't need to do that. I'm, 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 I'm above that. We don't have any desire, we don't have any ability. We are completely blind, spiritually dead, and that's all you can do, just lay dead, all right? But then when you are born again, you get this new desire, you get this new ability to believe, to obey, to, 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 to follow the Lord. So through faith in Jesus Christ, believers have been adopted into the family of God, and therefore, now we are all children of God. We belong to the family. So why do I bring this thing of adoption into the family of God? Well, because like any other child, we love our father we want, and we want to please him through our obedience most of the time. Because unfortunately, our obedience is far from perfect, just like our children. 
And even the most devoted child, even the most devoted Christian, fails to obey 100% of the time, just like our children. Even the best of our boys or girls doesn't obey all the time. So this is because we are still battling the flesh. Sin is powerful and enticing, so the threat of departing from God through our disobedience is always present. I remember, this has been many years, Mark Newman was giving a lesson where he says that we're all a second away from falling. And that, has, that stuck with me because he's right. You know, we're all facing temptations and we're just a moment away from falling into that temptation, whatever that might be. So, before I continue, let me just make something really clear in saying that a person does not become a Christian through obedience. Because as I said, if you're not born again, you cannot obey. All right? You cannot obey your way into salvation. If what, it, what, what makes us a Christian is our trust and our faith and our love in Christ. So love, faith, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ is actually what produces obedience in us believers. Now, all of us who have trusted Christ for the forgiveness of our sins are called to resist these ungodly desires and temptations and choose what is good. And in this verse, Peter urges his readers to not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. Peter is telling us to not be shaped by all the sinful thoughts and unrighteous desires that characterize our lives before we were born again. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that believers are a new creation and that the old things passed away. So through regeneration, God creates in us a new life and a new desire and an ability to live according to God's word. We have the desire to be with God, to know who he is, to learn from him, to follow him, to obey him. Life, I'm not going to deny it, is hard. And many of you have gone through a lot so far. And we are surrounded by a myriad of temptations daily, everywhere. We're being bombarded with all sorts of messages that are trying to entice us and to move us away from the, the, from the Lord. But believers must not continue living and behaving as they used to be, as we, were, as we were fallen creatures in the world. We need to act as according to who we are today, which is believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot continue living as, as we did before we were justified. We must trust and obey the Lord. That's what we're called to do. Then... In verses 15 and 16, Peter says that rather than yielding to evil desires, believers are to live holy lives. He says, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, verse 16, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So this call to holiness is nothing new. In fact, back in the book of Leviticus, and throughout the Mosaic law, Israel was called to be holy. And they were called to be holy by distinguishing themselves from evil practices of Egypt and Canaan and, and others that were around them. So to be holy is, to, be, is to, uh, to separate oneself from everything that is evil. And this command to be holy encompasses every aspect of our lives, okay? So it's, it's church, it's family, friends, acquaintances, work, school, you name it. Everything, every aspect of your life. We're called to be holy in everything, everywhere we go. There is not one aspect of our lives that is exempt from this command. And here, we need to pay attention to the Greek word kalesanta, which is translated as called. And the reason why we need to pay attention to this is because in my estimation, this word uh, um, manifests the infinite power of God. Because Kali Santa, or called, refers to God's effectual calling through which, God, through which he brings people to himself. This is the same calling that brings God's children out of darkness and into the light. This is the calling that brings sinners out from spiritual death into eternal life. When he says, follow me, Lazarus come forth, that is the calling. Let there be light. This calling is the calling that is, is, is in view here. 
So as you can see, this calling is not just a mere invitation. It is an irresistible command that we're capable to obey only by God's grace. Throughout our history, God has called his people to be holy. He has called us to live differently, to separate ourselves from the evil desires of the world and to live in a way that is pleasing to God. So God himself is the pattern of holiness. God himself is the pattern of our lives. Our sanctification is aimed to make us more holy, to make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, this is a consistent pattern from the very beginning. And it is our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that compels us to love him and serve him and pursue this holiness that he requires. And by grace, God gives us the ability and the willingness to obey what he commands. So you see, we don't do this on our own. This is not our own willpower. This is not just us against everything. It is God with us. He's carrying us. He's encouraging us. He's pushing us forward. He's shepherding us. That's the encouragement that we have. So let me close with an illustration. I hope it's a good one. The Lord is shaping our lives to be a lighthouse that sits firmly on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then on the top, on the top of this lighthouse, the light is shining and guiding those who are wandering in the darkness and it's guiding them to safety. Come to the rock, the rock is over here. And then the Holy Spirit has taken residence inside this lighthouse. And the Holy Spirit is inside the lighthouse, providing us with guidance and encouragement and assurance so that our light, our light can shine bright even in the darkness, darkest night and the stormiest weather. So that's where we are. We are this lighthouse, but in distance. In the distance, we see that there has been a storm forming for quite some time now. And reality is being redefined. That's the storm that is coming. The sky is becoming darker and dark, darker because good is now being called evil and evil is being called good. And all this darkness and that storm are closing in. And the wind is speaking of speed because wickedness is swirling all around us. And this, this massive wave is coming our way and it's gaining size and strength. This is all the ideas and the desires of the world and they are in a, in a crashing course heading to our way. And you and I know that impact is imminent because at some point, sooner rather than later, the wicked ideas of the world are gonna come crashing against our Christian beliefs. And the impact we know is gonna be strong and our lighthouse will be completely engulfed with water. And the lighthouse might become damaged, but it cannot be demolished. The light might become dim, but it will not be extinguished. And the reason is this, it's not because we are very strong. It is because the hand of the omnipotent God is holding it up. He's holding that lighthouse up and is keeping that flame burning on top. The Lord has called us to trust him and obey him. He has called us to be different, to be a light in the middle of the world's darkness. And he promised to be with us always, and he sent his Holy Spirit to guide us, to instruct us, and encourage us. We are not alone, we are not lost, and we are not helpless. The Lord is our rock, and he is with us, his children. But if you're not in Christ, there is no protection for you. You will be coming with that, with that wave and you will be the one crashing in the rocks and in the lighthouse. And there's no hope for you without Christ. So if you're here without Christ, we encourage you to turn to him for the salvation of your sins. He is the only rock in which you may be able to stand and withstand the attacks of the world. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the blessing that it is to, to know who you are and all the promises that you have made and, and to know that you are faithful and you will fulfill these promises in the future, that we can trust in you completely and that now you are keeping us on your hand and there's no one that can take us away from you. So Lord, we thank you for the assurance that it is to know that uh, we are safe in your arms. And Lord, we ask you for those who are lost that you may bring him to your son, 
that you would uh, open their eyes to, to see the truth, that you are um, the Lord of the universe, who by mercy sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. And Lord, we also lift up those who are um, going through trials and, and the difficulties that we spoke about. Lord, it's very easy to preach about these things when, when you don't have to carry these burdens. But I ask you, Lord, that you would be with all those of us who are suffering and going through difficulty, that you would continue giving them strength in their faith, trusting you, guidance and patience as they wait to see what's the outcome of these trials. Lord, we know that you do things for a reason and we don't understand it and, and, and we're weak and forgetful. So Lord, would you forgive us for that and, and, and allow us to just continue looking forward to your son, to your salvation, the things that are to come. And uh, Lord, would you please provide healing and, and blessing for, for all those who are sick and suffering. Uh, we ask for this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.